Good afternoon. I was asked to touch this uh, chapter again as it was felt that our study on this chapter was a bit hurried and as a result it was discombobulated. Now this is a very lengthy chapter and when you have different brothers take different sections of this chapter it would be fair to say that the continuity of thought is usually the first casualty. Now I wanted to start out by issuing a disclaimer that all the opinions expressed are strictly my own opinions and not necessarily 100% aligned with the views of others and that should not really surprise anyone because there is a lot of debate even amongst churches on some of these verses listed in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, as I told you before this is a very lengthy chapter and no two people teaching from this chapter will have identical messages. So I'm not going to be summarizing what other respected brothers have already discussed when they covered this chapter. Rather, I'll just be presenting a high-level overview of what I feel is presented in the chapter. It will be in no wise be comprehensive. Rather, the idea is to give you a skeletal overview and hopefully that will spur you to think along some of those lines which are uh, uh, expressed and then you can fill in the meat and the, on the skeleton in your own personal study. Now I'll uh, try to, on my part, briefly touch upon the skeletal overview where, and add some meat to that skeleton as and when we go along, uh, where I, I think a little further explanation might help and clarify the point being made. So that will be the process that we will be following. Now I just want to state at the very outset that we will not be reading this chapter in its entirety. Rather, we will be going verse by verse, and as we are going along in the study, we will be reading each verse. So, before I even start out, uh, let us back up a bit, and let us take a very, very, very high-level skeletal overview of the entire book of 1 Corinthians. As I see it, Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians deals with the following four main topics. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning verse 10 up to chapter 4 verse 21 is one section where Paul is dealing with divisions in the church. Starting at chapter 5 verse 1 up to chapter 6 verse 20, Paul deals with discipline in the church. And then starting at chapter 7 verse 1 up to chapter 14 verse 40, Paul is dealing with difficulties in the church. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul deals with disbelief in the church. So it's a very clear outline wherein you have division, discipline, difficulties, disbelief. That is the four main topics which is covered in 1 Corinthians 15. Now this fourth passage of 1 Corinthians 15 is in many ways remarkable and wonderful. In fact, I really didn't grasp the full depth of it until I myself was forced to go and study it. Because when somebody else is taking the Bible study, we just glance at the chapter and do a quick reading. And if we have some thoughts, we just might express those thoughts. But when I had to go and do a full summary, uh, that's when I really, really appreciated it. So in many ways, I feel that when you prepare for a message, you are the biggest beneficiary actually. So one of the remarkable things about this chapter is the fact that in this chapter you will see four first things and also you will see four last things. First of all, let's look at the four first things which you will observe in this chapter. which says we have the first message wherein Paul says, I declare unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So in other words, the first message. Then you have the first fruits presented. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then you have the first man presented. Wherein Paul says, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And then you have the first condition mentioned. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. So you have the four first things, the first message, the first fruits, the first man, and the first condition. And in this chapter, you'll also find four last things. You have the last witness. So Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me. And there the me is the apostle Paul is talking of himself. And then you have the last Adam presented. Uh, Paul says, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And then you have the last enemy presented. Where Paul says, 
the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And finally, you have the last trump. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. So in this wonderful thing, we have four first things and four last things. That will help us understand things better as we begin our study on this absolutely wonderful chapter. Now, if you ask me this chapter, and in particular this passage, this 58 verses, breaks down into two main sections. And there is a clear pattern again. Section A or section 1 goes from 1 Corinthians 15, it starts at verse 1 and ends at verse 19. There, in those 19 verses, Paul is dealing with the resurrection of Christ. In the second section, or in section B, which starts at verse 20, all the way up to verse 58, Paul is dealing with the resurrection of Christians. So you have the resurrection of Christ, followed by the resurrection of Christians. So once again, a very clear pattern. Now let's look at the first 19 verses, which is the resurrection of Christ. That's what is covered in those 19 verses. Paul starts off by saying that it is an undeniable fact of history. And that is what Paul establishes that fact in the first 11 verses. In today's uh, study, we are only going to study those 11 verses. This is why I needed five full sessions to cover this entire chapter because all of today we are only going to cover the 11 verses. You see at the heart of the Christian gospel is the resurrection of Christ. If you ask me, no other religion is based on the historical fact of a bodily resurrection. This is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. This is unique to Christianity. You see Christianity as a whole stands or falls based on this very important fact. Now, I remember reading long time ago that, you know, somewhere in northern India, they had found the relics of an old saint, and they had made a big hue and cry about it, and saying that, you know, this man existed, and, you know, they were doing some carbon dating and all kinds of things. And I remember reading that, and I remember telling myself, or speaking to myself, and saying to myself, or encouraging myself, and saying, you know what, they will never find a single bone of my blessed Savior and my blessed Master. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose from the grave. That is why you are not going to find a single bone of us. So when we look at verses 1 and 2, Paul is presenting the fruit in the, his fruit in the gospel. You see, Paul declares this fact that cannot be denied by the Corinthians. And that's what he's trying to get the point across. First of all, he reminds them of what he preached to them. That's what you see in the first part of the first verse. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now you remember that incident in Acts chapter 17. The Acts chapter 17 is where Paul is at Mars Hill. Paul was, you'll remember that uh, Paul was given a very fair hearing by the intellectual Greeks in that city or at March Hill, and he preached unto them. But then he mentioned the resurrection of Christ and then they laughed him out of court. You see, Paul preached Christ crucified at Corinth. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, 2 says that, that he preached Christ crucified. But the important thing to remember is that Paul never left Christ at the cross. Paul goes a step further and he declares that Christ rose from the dead. That is why he says Christ was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. The second thing, when he, Paul talks about this fruit in the gospel, he reminds them or he's reminding the Corinthians of what they professed. And this you find in the second part of verse 1 and also in verse 2. Which also you have received. And wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. You see, the Corinthians are being reminded that they had professed their salvation. That is what the second part of the first verse is saying, that you have professed your salvation. And their salvation rested on the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, Paul is reminding them of their standing. 
They're standing. You see, Paul is saying that they're standing before God also rested in the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. You see, the basis of profession of faith in Christ, which is what you see in, in the first part of second uh, verse 2, was on a dead and a resurrected Christ. That was their basis. Their basis was on a dead and a resurrected Christ. And so the burden of faith in Christ, Paul is saying that the burden rested on them. To do what? He's telling them to keep it in memory. That means you and I also need to keep that in memory. That Christ rose from the grave. Else, a dead Christ means a dead religion. So in verses 1 and 2, Paul is speaking about his fruit in the gospel. And what is he reminding them? He reminds them of what he preached. He also reminds them of what they have professed. professed. And he reminds them that their profession and, the, uh, that, uh, and their salvation and he reminds them of their standing. Now when you go to verses 3 to 8, Paul is uh, now presenting to us the facts of the gospel. First of all, in verses 3 through 4, he is stating the facts. That's what he's going out and doing. So first to state the facts, he takes us to several places. First of all, Paul takes us to the cross. That's what you find in verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So in the first part of verse 3, you have the reality of Christ's death being presented to us. You see, there can be absolutely no doubt that Christ died. There were hundreds of witnesses to his death. You will remember that when his body was pierced with a Roman spear, out came blood and water which medically proved that he was dead. Then you remember that the Roman soldiers went about breaking the legs of the two other malefactors and they, when they came to Christ, they did not break his legs because they saw that he had already died. Paul then gives us the reasons for Christ's death. That's what you see in the second part of verse 3. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that the reasons for Christ's death was for our sins. So it was because of our sins and for our sins that he died. It was for our sin that he had to go to the cross. And then Paul says that he died in accordance with the scriptures. In fact, if you think about it, every Old Testament animal sacrifices pointed forward to Calvary. The entire Jewish religion was predicated on Calvary. Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 53 and a host of other scriptures all pointed to Calvary. So now Paul first took us to the cross where he stated the facts. Now Paul takes us next to the symmetry that you find in the first part of verse 4 and that he was buried. You see, Isaiah had long foretold that the Lord Jesus Christ would have an honorable burial. Where do I get that from? I get that from Isaiah 53 verse 9. He was to be with the rich in his death. Now you'll recall that two very rich and influential men joined hands and joined forces to bury the Lord. Both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were men of wealth and power. They were also men, members of the Sanhedrin. And they were also secret disciples of the Lord. But they used their wealth and their power to good effect. John 19.39 tells us that the weight of the spices alone provided by Nicodemus was essentially worth a king's ransom. You see, Joseph of Arimathea contributed his own exceedingly valuable family tomb for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord was buried. But once again, in keeping with the scriptures, you find that his body was miraculously preserved from corruption and decay. And you find that was a fulfillment of verse 10 of Psalm 16. Paul now takes us to the calendar. This is the third place Paul is taking us. First he took us to the cross, then he took us to the cemetery. And now he takes us to the calendar. This you find in verse 4, the second part of verse 4. And that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, when you get to the calendar, you'll find that the calendar reminds us of a deed. It reminds us of a day. And it also reminds us that there is a detail to be remembered. 
first of all let's consider a deed which has to be remembered what is the deed which has to be remembered paul is saying he rose again now most of you may not know this person but if you are a very good student of the law you will know who this person is his name is dr simon greenleaf he was the royal professor of law at harvard university he is considered one of the greatest and most brilliant legal minds that ever lived he specialized in something called evidence law in fact he wrote a very famous legal volume which is entitled a treatise on the law of evidence it's a three volume book and that remains the standard textbook in american law even today it is considered the gold standard dr simon greenleaf believed that the resurrection of jesus christ was an absolute hoax and so he was determined once and for all to prove and use his legal uh, brilliant mind to expose this myth of the resurrection once and for all so he went about thoroughly examining the evidence and after examining the evidence for the resurrection dr greenleaf came to the exact opposite conclusion dr greenleaf concluded that according to the jurisdiction of legal evidence the resurrection of jesus christ was the best supported event in all of history dr greenleaf was so convinced by the overwhelming evidence that he did what nobody else thought he would ever do which was he committed his life to the lord jesus christ now i want you to take a back, take you back in time to world history and if you are a student of world history you will remember this uh, incident from long time back one day napoleon if you remember was the master of europe he was busy putting down kings and he was controlling the lives of millions of people fast forward a few days or a few years and you'll find that this master of europe has now become the caged lion of europe because he was exiled to the remote island of saint helena there he was berfed of any company he was under constant surveillance he was a prisoner of the british navy so something must have happened for this man who had been the master of europe who was the emperor of france to now become a caged lion and a prisoner of the british navy something did happen you'll ask me what happened the answer is waterloo happened now think about the lord jesus christ one day the lord jesus christ was nailed to a roman cross he was beaten he was scourged to the bone he was crowned with thorns he was spit upon and he was mocked but i want you to look again within a few short years he is acknowledged to be god by millions of people and there is a church dedicated to his worship in every major city of the roman empire once again something must have happened something did happen and you'll ask me what happened what happened was resurrection happened now let's go back to that battle of waterloo for a brief moment because i want to take that illustration and then use it in the in the study which we are doing today now if you recall the battle of waterloo was fought on june 18th which was a sunday morning and it was in the year 1815 now across the english channel all of england watched and waited with bated breath for some word about the outcome of the fat of the battle between england and france france and its forces were led by napoleon bonaparte who was the emperor of france while england and its forces were led by sir arthur wellesley who was the duke of wellington now the fate of all europe hung in the balance and then the word came now this is before the invention of the telegraph this was in before the invention of the fax machine and this is before the invention of the cell phones what they used was something called semaphore signaling and the semaphore signaling took place from high tower to high tower was used to transmit the messages between two distant points the semaphore began to signal and to flash the tidings to the eager watchers on the british shore who were looking for the signal however it was an extremely foggy day the message was only partially received and when it was received it read wellington and then there was a pause and then the next word comes across defeated <laughs> 
Wellington defeated. The entire country went into mourning. By and by, what happened is the weather began to clear up and the fog started lifting. And then the semaphore, which was still signaling, the full message came through. The new message says Wellington defeated Napoleon. You see, that was the message all along. But they only, they, they only uh, uh, saw Wellington defeated and assumed that England had lost the battle. But when you saw Wellington defeated Napoleon, that means Wellington uh, won the battle. And you see, the difference in the two messages is like the difference between night and day. Now, I want you to keep that illustration in mind because we are going to use it in the next um, uh, illustration, which are going into the person and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us double back at rapid speed back to Calvary. At Calvary, the Lord of glory was nailed to Calvary's tree. He was taken down dead and he was buried. You'll find that the rocks were rent. The sun went dark and refused to shine. You'll find that many graves gaped wide open. You'll find that two disciples walked on the Emmaus road. They were absolutely disheartened and dispirited. The Lord's disciples all uh, flew in different directions and all went into hiding. The tomb was sealed with the power of Rome. The tomb was then put under guard after being sealed shut. And it looked like it was all over. All hope was gone from you. The message seemed loud and clear. Death had once again triumphed. For three long days and three interminable nights, the planet spun on its axis and described its orbit. The sun shone down indeed, but only because it was a force of habit designed by the master creator. The earth still revolved around its axis and it rotated around the sun. The clock ticked down 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours to a day, one day gone, two days gone, and on into a third day. For 72 never-ending hours, the universe held its bated breath. Minute after minute, for some 4,320 minutes, second after second, for 259,200 seconds, and still that lifeless form lay cold and unmoving. Death seemed to have triumphed once again, as it does with all men since the beginning of creation. Around and round the world spun on its axis as it traversed its ordained path. Three days and three nights while heaven moaned, yet on earth below men laughed. They chatted, they gambled and they went about their petty business as so nothing had happened. And then the unthinkable happened. After three days had gone by, we find that Jesus rose from the grave. The message now comes through loud and clear. Now that the fog of death had been lifted, the message was loud and clear. Jesus defeated death. Jesus defeated death. Hallelujah. What a savior. That is the savior we believe in. A, a, a dead Christ, yes, but we also believe in a resurrected Christ. That is what gives power to the gospel. <coughs> Excuse me. Indeed, he has defeated death. In fact, when the apostle John, he was on the Isle of Patmos, he saw him. He saw the one who could declare, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. We all can say amen and amen to that. Indeed, there was a deed to be remembered. You see, he had laid down his life freely and now he had raised himself from the dead. You see, raising himself from the dead, if you ask me, took more power than creating all the universe with the power of his word. And you find that he conquered death itself by raising himself from the grave. Well might we sing along with the hymn writer, Vainly they watch his blood, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, 
with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Secondly, Paul says that it is a day to be remembered. He rose again the third day. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul says uh, he rose again the third day. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus told his disciples he would do. He told them in Matthew 27, 63, in John chapter 2, verse 19. That's what he said. He will rise again on the third day. But his disciples were dull of hearing and they lackadaisically forgot all about it. But his enemies, mind you, did not forget the words of the Lord Jesus Christ regarding his resurrection. Because when you go and read uh, Matthew 27, verse 63 and 64, there they say, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, that after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people that he is risen from the dead. So the last error will be worse than the first. You see, when the resurrection became a grand reality, what did the Sanhedrin do? The Sanhedrin paid large amounts of money to circulate a lie, a blatant lie, that the disciples stole, stole the body of the Lord Jesus Christ while the guards were sleeping. Think about it. What a draconian lie. It is an absolutely draconian lie. That lie, if you ask me, would not stand the litmus test in any court of law in any country of the world because of the simple fact that here we have witnesses who are testifying that they were sound asleep. Yet, despite being sound asleep, they are absolutely certain who stole the body. Let me ask you a question. If they were sleeping, then any logical person would ask this question. How did they know who stole the body? Were, they, were their eyes wide open while they were sleeping and registering everything which was happening while they were all fast asleep? Clearly, that draconian lie wouldn't fly in any court anywhere in the world. Finally, Saul of Tarsus, remember, he was a die-hard enemy of the gospel and he chose not to believe the resurrection till he came face to face on that Damascus road with the risen Christ. Paul's testimony after that magnificent encounter after that day was, he rose again the third day. You see, from that day, Paul flung himself unreservedly in the cause of Christ, all because he had seen a risen Christ who had risen from the grave on the third day. Thirdly, Paul says that this is a detail to be remembered. Again, in, this is I'm getting it from verse 4. Paul says that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What was the detail? The detail was that Christ's resurrection was according to the scriptures. You see, the Lord Jesus himself pointed to Jonah as a type of himself. Matthew 12, 40, the Lord Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, let us recap. What did we study in verses 3 and 4? In verses 3 and 4, Paul is stating the facts. To state the facts, Paul takes us, first of all, to the cross. And at the cross, Paul explains the reality of Christ's death. At the cross, Paul also explains the reason for Christ's death. After the cross, Paul takes us then to the symmetry. And finally, Paul takes us to the calendar. And it is at the calendar, he says that it is a deed to be remembered. He also says that it is a day to be remembered. And finally, Paul says it is a detail to be remembered. So those are the verses and now we are going to start at verses 5 through 8 which is the next section where if in the previous section the facts were stated now Paul jumps to substantiating the facts. So in other words the facts are substantiated in verses 5 through 8. Verses 3 and 4 the facts were stated here in verses 5 through 8 the facts are substantiated. First of all Paul says he was seen, he was seen, he was seen. By who was he seen? By his friends. Verse 5. <coughs> you see, Paul lines up a number of eyewitnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, Paul says, by the man who denied him. That is what you find in, in the first part of verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas. Now you remember, Peter was the man who denied the Lord. 
despite his threefold denial of the Lord, we see that the Lord was gracious to Peter. Unlike us human beings who will be hard on somebody who falls, the Lord was not like that. He was gracious to Peter and in fact so gracious that he gives Peter a very personal and private audience which is a one-on-one -on -one audience with a risen Christ. You find that in Luke chapter 24 verse 34. Peter had seen the Lord on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and that is where you find that the Lord had challenged Peter and he had asked Peter, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? So what was the effect on Peter after he saw a resurrected Christ? You will find that Peter goes from being Peter the covered. Peter the covered was the one who swore oaths and curses when he was identified by a kitchen maid. He goes from Peter the covered to Peter the courageous. This same Peter who was a covered has now become courageous Peter who stands before thousands and he openly accused them of murdering their own Messiah. Paul then says, you know what? He was also seen by the men he had discipled. That's what you find in the second part of verse 5. Then of the twelve. You see, the disciples had gathered in the upper room and they had seen a resurrected Christ. Peter and John had already confirmed that the tomb was empty. In the upper room, the risen Christ had materialized suddenly and set about convincing them that it was truly he who was standing in their midst. In fact, in John chapter 20, he says that he showed them his hands and his side. Luke 24 says that he ate food with them and he invited them to come and touch him. Eight days later, he addressed a skeptical Thomas who was missing in that first meeting with the following words. Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing secondly paul says that he was seen by his flock you'll find that in verse 6 1 corinthians 15 6 says that after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep no wonder when paul stood before king agrippa that he could tell to king agrippa oh king agrippa these things are public knowledge. One, Acts 26, 26. That's where he says that. These things are public knowledge. Thirdly, Paul says that he was seen by his family. You find that in the first part of verse 7. After that, he was seen of James. Now, if you read Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, you will find that the Lord had four brothers. Well, when I say four brothers, I mean four half-brothers. And their names are given. James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. Not only did he have four half-brothers, but he also had at least three half-sisters. And you'll ask me why I make that assumption of three. Because look at the wording. The wording there is, and his sisters, are they not all with us? You see, had there been only two sisters, then it would have read, and both his sisters, are they not with us? Because that is generally the accepted way the English language differentiates between two versus multiple numbers. And that is why I said at least three half-sisters, because otherwise it would have said, Bo aren't both his sisters with us? Now in John 7, the Apostle John writing bluntly states that the family of the Lord Jesus Christ completely manifested the same unbelief that was prevailing in the nation of Israel. But after the resurrection of Christ, something drastically changed. We find that these same people who were uh, manifesting that unbelief now become believers. And they, why do I say that? Because they are found there in the upper room waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you find that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. Their spirit of unbelief had completely vanished. You will find that James now goes on to become a pillar of the Jerusalem church. And he addresses himself in the, in the book which he wrote, which bears his name, as a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another half-brother, Jude, Two wrote, uh, wrote a book which is again one, one of the New Testament books that bears his name. 
the conversion and eyewitness testimony of the Lord's immediate family members as a result of his resurrection makes them excellent, excellent witnesses. Fourthly, P, Paul says that he was seen by his followers. You find that in verse 7, the second part. And 1 Corinthians 15 said that he was seen by his followers. This seems to be a larger company than the 12 met, mentioned in verse 5. Fifthly, Paul says that he was seen by his foe. This is what you find in verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. You see the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was a monumental, absolutely monumental event in the history of the church. He had been the most bitter, energetic and determined foe of Christianity. You will find that he traveled far and wide seeking to stamp out what he considered to be a pernicious cult. He was on a mission of persecution when he had been arrested on the Damascus road by a risen Christ. You see, the story of his conversion is of such significance that it is told three times in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. So Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me. And so you have, Paul says, he was the last witness. So as I told you earlier, in this chapter, we meet the last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. You find the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And then we are introduced to the last Trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And in this verse, you are introduced to the last witness, which was Paul himself. You see, Paul never ceased to be amazed at the grace of God, which found him an enemy, a persecutor, an injurious man who God in his grace had plucked him and saved him as a brand from hell. If you think about it, you and I, we too, were once were foes, destined for the fires of hell. But we now have been plucked as a brand from hell. What could we say when we realize that? Other than what the hymn writer wrote when he said, Oh, what a wonderful savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful savior is Jesus, my Lord. So let's recap these four verses, which I just now covered. In these four verses, you find that the facts are substantiated. He first presented the facts. Now he goes about substantiating the facts. How are they substantiated? First of all, Paul says that he was seen by his friends. And so there he says that he was seen by Peter, the man who denied him. Then he says that he was seen by the men whom he had discipled. Paul then says that he was seen by his flock. Paul then says he was seen by his family. Paul then says he was seen by his followers. And finally, Paul says he was seen by his foe. The foe was none other than Paul himself. In verses 9 through 11, Paul, you will find is describing his faith in, his, in the gospel. First of all, in verse 9, Paul gives his testimony. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. You see, the Holy Spirit records in great detail the kind of man that Paul was before he was converted. Paul himself testifies about himself that he was a trained Jewish rabbi who had learned at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul himself was a cosmopolitan Greek scholar. He was also a Roman citizen. He was also a fearless ambassador for Christ and he was the church's foremost theologian and missionary. We find that Peter had denied the Lord. You find that Thomas had doubted the Lord's words and his resurrection. But Paul had done something far, far, far worse. Something which none of the others had done. He had actively persecuted Christ and his church. Paul had the blood of Christian martyrs on his hands. In fact, in testifying before King Agrippa, Paul says in Acts chapter 26 verses 9 through 11, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received the authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, what did Paul do? I gave my voice against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue 
and I compel them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad. This is Paul talking about himself being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. The Holy Spirit further testifies in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 that Paul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Acts 22, 4, Paul says, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. In other words, he spared no one. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, Paul says he made havoc of the church. Havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. He spared no one. No wonder Paul spoke very disparagingly of himself as the least and most unworthy of them all. As gloomy and as dark a scene as has been painted by the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit before his conversion as to who Paul was, Paul now takes us to the fact that the grace of God, the grace of God even reached a wretched, wretched, wretched sinner like him. So he now takes us to his triumphs. So in verses 10 and 11, you find his triumphs. In verse 9, as I told you, it was his testimony. In verses 10 and 11, you find his triumphs. First of all, he begins with transforming grace. And that's what you find in the first part of verse 10. In verse 10, he says that, you know what? Paul recalls that transforming grace of God towards him. That is why Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Why was this transforming grace not in vain? Let me ask you that question. If you ask that question, uh, my answer would be this transforming grace of God was not in vain because that transforming grace of God made Paul into the great apostle to the Gentiles. Because it is that same transforming grace which allowed him to write the greater part of the New Testament. It is this transforming grace that caused the scales to fall off from Paul's eyes on that Damascus road. In fact, you find that grace become one of Paul's favorite words that he uses over and over and over again. You see, grace had transformed Paul's life. He had transformed his hatred into love. It had transformed his pride into humility. And it had transformed an agent of the Sanhedrin, an assassin of the Sanhedrin into the great ambassador for Christ. Transforming grace transformed a worldly, a whirling human tornado of hate and rage into an ambassador of love and peace. Paul doesn't just stop at transforming grace. He also talks about transcending grace. And you find that in the second part of verse 10 and verse 11. Paul recalls that transcending grace of God when he says, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached and so he believed. So here in, the, in ten, verse 10, Paul is telling his method. What was his method? His method was to work with absolute, utter abandonment. You see, Christian expositors say that the Apostle Paul traveled roughly 5,600 miles by foot and roughly 6,800 miles by sea to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to untold millions. In the space of 24 uh, of 20 years, Paul evangelized along a line somewhere around 1,500 miles all the way from Antioch to Illyricum. While other apostles were debating about the Great Commission, Paul was busy evangelizing Tars Tarsus and all that part of his native land. And he worked, Paul says, with utter abasement. This you find in verse 11. Therefore, whether it is I, it were I or they. What is Paul saying there? Paul says it does not matter who did the work. They or I, it makes absolutely no difference. The only thing that matters, the only thing that makes a difference is we need to reach millions for Christ. And in verse 11, Paul gives his message. Paul says his message was both apostolic and authentic in nature. 
apostolic because the message was preached which he preached was the one given by the apostles themselves authentic because the message had been confirmed by the holy spirit's coming and therefore it is deemed authentic so in these verses what we basically see is paul and his faith in the gospel so as i told you paul first shared his testimony and then he shared his triumphs paul talked about the transforming grace of god and then he talked about the transcending grace of god the transcending grace of god that allowed him to work with utter abandonment that transcending grace that allowed him to work with utter abasement this afternoon i want to ask you and me this same question what are we doing for the lord do we work with utter abandonment do we walk with utter abasement it is honestly a question which you and i need to think about and ponder over uh, i guess it is after the uh, pandemic we haven't even done hardly any uh, uh, we have used that as an excuse to stop the gospel meetings we need to hang our head in shame honestly because if we don't reach the millions who is supposed to reach the millions it is something which burdens me uh, I, but i am putting myself in that same boat hey what have i done nothing i i we are all looking to somebody else to pick up the bucket it's not the only the elders responsibility to bucket uh, to pick up the bucket it's everybody's responsibility we all have a responsibility but anyway that is something for us to ponder over because we have a burden to reach out the untold millions if paul could do all those things what is you what are you and i doing about it with that i will stop and i will give this opportunity for um, people to express additional uh, uh, thoughts on this topic uh, as well as if somebody has a question hopefully one of the elders will pick up and answer the question